Hey everyone, uh, it's me Rebecca. I'm here with Patrick. Patrick, say hi. Hello. Uh, and of course this is Eden because we can't not have Eden, right? So um, she's a fantastic research assistant and I'm going to put her down so I can talk at you. So today we're going to talk about an introduction to historical research. For anyone who's watching this who doesn't know me, I've been doing HEMA for about six years. And in terms of my academic background, I majored in history at Syracuse University. I graduated with distinction in history and did my thesis project on Henry VII of England. Um, Tudor history is a huge interest of mine, so I'm going to be referencing that a lot. Uh, and I've done a little bit of graduate level research as well. Uh, just so you know that I'm not completely pulling this out of my ass. Not that I wouldn't do that, but I'm not going to. So, to start, I want to talk a bit about where my interests are in talking about historical research in HEMA, which is, we have lots and lots of manuals, and lots of people analyzing the manuals, looking at the manuals. Uh, Patrick has his own opinions on certain translations of certain manuals. <clears throat> but what, Understatement. <laughs> But what we're missing, a lot of the times, is the context, the historical context, to put these uh, manuals in, in the right context, to have a fuller understanding of them. So I like looking at intersections, or, well, I call them intersections, but areas where history and HEMA come together. For example, uh, one of the things we can look at is fashion history. Well, how does fashion history relate to HEMA? There are actually two ways we can look at this. The first way, and the most obvious way, is when we talk about armor and looking at armor. Armor historically follows fashion. So some trends in armor and a lot of, say, decorative pieces in armor will follow what the fashion trends were at the time. So if you're looking at a suit, a full suit of plate armor, and you're not sure what date that armor is from, one of the things you can do is look at the shoes. A pointy shoe will date from before 1500, almost certainly. A square shoe will date almost certainly after 1500. It's one of the few times there's a very clear dividing line between fashion trends. And What's the difference between a square shoe and a pointed shoe? Uh, functionally, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, in terms of fashion, the fashion in the 1400s was for long pointed shoes, um, not quite as dramatic as say in the 1300s, and then for some reason around the year 1500 that point gets lopped off and it just becomes a square shoe. Why? I don't know, but this is what it is. The second way that we can use fashion history to look at HEMA is by looking at medieval textiles. What are textiles? Uh, textiles would be uh, cloth and fabric, the things that you can use to make uh, clothing primarily, but also blankets, tablecloths, um, curtains, and so on. And most textiles in this period were woven. Uh, if you want to learn about historical weaving, I definitely recommend talking to Jess Finley. She is a font of uh, information. But one of the, the really interesting things is that medieval garments tended to be very thick, made from thick wools and thick linens. So if you're ever at a HEMA cutting competition and you see people doing the middle how cut, if you were to do that cut with a sharp sword today, if I was to do that cut to Patrick, because for some reason I got really mad at him for some reason, and he was just wearing a, he's wearing a thin t-shirt like me right now, uh, and I was to do that, it would, uh, it would hurt, it would injure him, how severely debatable, but it would injure him. If Patrick was wearing his medieval doublet, his quilted, uh, quilted doublet, army coat doublet, there's multiple things. There's a Japan, there's an arming coat, there's a doublet. The, the one that you used in the engagement photos. Uh, that was a... that was an arming coat. So, 
if Patrick was to wear his army coat and I tried to do that cut with a sharp sword, the damage I would do would be minimal because the textiles are extremely thick. For proof of this, in previous HEMA competitions, one of the rounds in cutting was to wrap tatami in layers of linen and see how far you could cut through it. And even the people that won the competition could not cut very far. So how does this all relate to historical research? So this relates to historical research uh, in that to understand the context of what a sword could and could not do at the time period that the manuals were written, one of the things you need to know is, well, what kind of fabrics were people wearing? And how do you know what kind of fabrics people were wearing? Well, you go and you research it. So how do you research something? That is a fantastic question. The first thing you need to do is you need to choose a topic. So Patrick, what are some of the things you're interested in? Stabbing people. What are some of the things <laughs> that you are interested in that might not relate to swords at all? Um, from a historical perspective, uh, food, horses, and travel. Those are all great things. Let's start with food. Uh, how can food relate to HEMA? Patrick, do you have any ideas? Uh, an army works on its stomach. This idea was first presented by Napoleon, but is accurate. By looking at medieval recipes and a medieval diet, we can get an understanding of what the likely physical health and bodies and physiology of medieval soldiers may have been like. So, say you're interested in cooking, the first place you want to start is with a general survey. This is assuming you've never done any research on this ever. You want to start with a, a general survey. And here I'm going to switch to my own interests in Tudor England, mostly because I have the props here to do that. So when I was in my late teens, early 20s, uh, I watched Lord of the Rings and I got really, really interested in English history. One of the first things I did was I took a class the fall of my freshman year at Syracuse on the history of England up until 1688. These were our main textbooks. They are a general survey, which means it's a general overview. These are written for high school or college students. You can find other general surveys on Amazon, at your local bookstore, but it gives you a very broad overview of the topic. So how do you know if something is a general survey as compared to a secondary source or a primary source or something like that? That's a great question. A general survey is generally a type of secondary source, and we will get into the differences between primary and secondary sources in a little bit. Um, how you know something is a general survey, um, usually in the author's introduction, they will give you some sort of heads up that, hey, this book is meant for the general reader, or this book is meant for college students, or this book is meant for so-and-so. So, when you're reading these, you will notice that naturally you will gravitate towards a specific area. So the area of interest that most grabs me is the area bet between the Wars of the Roses and Henry VIII, um, the story of Henry VII and him taking the Tudor throne. We don't have time to go over that entire story. Um, all I can say about it, it's an amazing rags to riches story, and I don't know why no one's made a really good movie of it yet, because it's really cool. But because I noticed that Henry the Seventh wasn't that one of Shakespeare's plays? No, there is Henry the Sixth, there is Richard the Third, there is Henry the Eighth. There is no Henry the Seventh play. Henry the Seventh is the character, the Earl of Richmond, in the play Richard the Third. Uh, Henry did actually have the title Earl of Richmond, and one of my favorite little tidbits is people assume that Shakespeare's portrayal of Richard III is greatly exaggerated, 
but when they discovered Richard III's skeleton in a car park, they discovered that he actually had severe scoliosis and a type of scoliosis that meant he would have been more comfortable on top of a horse, riding a horse, than he would have been otherwise. And if the scoliosis was real, then the propaganda aspect may not have been as exaggerated as historians think it is. It's one of my favorite little tidbits. Nice. So, as I was reading through this, I noticed that my interest started to narrow towards Henry VII, Henry VIII. So that caused me to want to research more on those topics. So, I have here, I'll be coming back to this, but this is a pop history uh, biography of Henry VIII's Six Wives. Yeah. Uh, so I will come back to this book in a little bit when we talk about secondary sources. Uh, but this is a uh, pop history, meaning you can go to Barnes & Noble and buy it on the shelf, um, of Henry VIII's Six Wives as, so as something that is more specific to the topic I am interested in. And you'll find that the more you keep reading and researching, probably the narrower your interest becomes, the more specific your interest becomes, and the sources you read start being less pop history and more academic, more primary source. And, and we are going to talk about that in, this, in a second. Uh, Patrick, do you have any other questions on choosing a topic? No, I think that choosing a topic is pretty straightforward. It's find something that you're interested in, find something that other people have already started to write about, something that can get you started. Yeah, yeah. So from there, we're going to, we're going to talk about primary sources and secondary sources. When we're done talking about those, we'll talk about how to find sources. But for now, we're going to stick to primary and secondary sources. Now, if you remember your high school history, you should probably remember a little bit about primary and secondary sources. Probably not. Yeah. What, are, what are secondary sources? Well, secondary sources are synthesis and analysis of primary sources. What does that mean? Analysis. Secondary sources are analyses, compilations of primary sources. Um, so... The best way that I know how to explain this, imagine you have a historical event and you want to put it on trial. A primary source can be called as a witness at the trial because the primary source was there. So for example, if you're researching United States history, the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are primary sources for the, United, the Revolution uh, and the Constitution and constitutional law. Uh, if you are uh, researching Tudor England, a primary source could be this, uh, letters and papers of Henry VIII. Uh, now, the print here is really, really tiny, uh, but this is, this is just one volume of like 20, I think, at least, um, but papers that were written during the reign of Henry VIII, some letters from him, some letters to him, a lot of government documents, uh, things like uh, wardrobe rolls, which basically um, account books uh, for what was bought, what was paid. Uh, other primary sources uh, would include things like Chronicles of the Crusades, and I'm going to come back to this in one second. Uh, and whereas a secondary source did not directly experience the event in question. A secondary source would be if I were to write a book about Henry VIII today, that's a secondary source. I have no direct knowledge of Henry VIII as a person. I wasn't there. Uh, in terms of Hema, this uh, book, The Martial Arts of Renaissance Europe, is both a survey, um, like a general HEMA survey. It's an older book, but still one of the better ones out there. And it's also a secondary source. Nothing in this book is an actual historical uh, fighting manual, 
but it's analysis of many of the different fighting manuals and trends throughout uh, Renaissance fencing, uh, starting with Liftenauer and Longsword and going all the way up. I think it goes up to a small sword. It definitely goes up to rapier and gets funky with the geometrical patterns and things. So to sum it up, a primary source is something from the time period you're looking at. A yes. secondary source talks about the primary source. Yes. And a survey talks about or references primary and secondary sources. Uh, well, a survey is a type of secondary source. Yeah. A primary source happened during the time period of the event or events in question. But one important thing to, to note is that a primary source does not have to be a book. A secondary source doesn't have to either, although it almost always is. A primary source does not have to be written in any form. A primary source can be art, it can be surviving weapons, it can be surviving tools, surviving architecture. Um, going back to art for a second and relating, going back to fashion history. Uh, surviving art from the time period in question gives us a lot of information about what we know about historical costuming and dress. For example, Hans Holbein is one of my favorite artists, primarily because his portraiture of Tudor-era women is so clear and detailed. So this is a portrait of Jane Seymour, Henry VIII's third wife. From a distance, it looks like this is one complete gown, but we know that this was actually composed of a number of separate parts. And now most people with a familiarity in Tudor fashion know that the undersleeve and the oversleeve were different parts of the gown, um, that the four-piece here um, was a different part than the overgown. By, what do you mean by a different part? Uh, that they're not all the same garment. They're separate garments that you put on. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize unless you get really into this is that this front piece of the bodice called the placard isn't just sewn on. It's attached with a row of pens. The lacing that closes the gown is underneath the placard. Uh, there's no back lacing in this gown. In a lot of historical movies, uh, you, when you see a woman's gown, you see laces in the back. In this case, uh, this gown would have either laced under the placard, possibly at the sides. Um, if you ever watch a movie from that's set in the 18th century, and you see back lacing on a woman's gown, it's probably inaccurate. And the reason for this is most of those gowns opened at the front, there is no functional need for a gown to open both at the front and the back. The only time this actually becomes functional is in the 19th century when the split busk is introduced in corsetry, which meant that women could put on and, um, I guess, lace up or tighten up their own corsets. Another example of primary source that is not written down um, would be for those of you who are interested in Viking era tactics, since the North, the Viking era tactics didn't leave us a lot of written manuals, um, we do have a lot of preserved battle sites and skeletons. And one of the things that was noticed is that one of the most common injuries to the surviving bones was injuries to the back of the leg or the knee. This tells us that, number one, this was not an area of the body that was well protected by the armor of that era, and number two, that yeah, the back of the leg is definitely a valid target. And in fact, the only reason that you don't have it as a legal tar uh, target in most team tournaments is that a strike to the back of the knee can seriously injure someone. Same reason you don't target the spine or back of the head. Um, so those are some examples of primary sources that aren't written, and I include those uh, because they can be a lot of fun. I mean, this is why archaeologists basically exist. Um, and a bit different, if you don't want to slog through a ton of books, there are other things you can look at. That said, 
or any serious historical research, there will be a lot of reading involved. Primary sources sound great, right? There are a few issues that we have to concern ourselves with. What kind of issues? So the first one we have to worry about are author biases. In narrative documents, every author will have a bias. I bring you back to this Chronicles of the Crusades. Um, now, would you, you, you know about the Crusades, right? More or less. Yes. So would you imagine that a Christian writing about the Crusades, a Jewish person write, writing about the Crusades, and a Muslim writing about the Crusades would have the same viewpoint? They'd probably have um, differences of opinion, but... That would be under, understating it. <laughs> um, for a Christian of the era, the Crusaders uh, may have been a noble hero. Maybe not, depending on your position in society. Uh, for a Jewish person living in Germany at the time, uh, the Crusaders uh, possibly meant a massacre of their entire towns or families, uh, and they would have less fond memories. And I'm going to guess that you can probably imagine what Muslims in Palestine would have thought of the Crusaders as well. So one of the things you have to take in account into account anytime you read a narrative source, what are the biases of the soft book? Even if you're reading a biography of a, a primary source biography of a monarch or another person, um, you have to account, all right, was this person um, trying to write basically hagiography or praise the ruler? Or were they trying to denigrate them? A great example of this is a guy called Procopius, uh, who lived in uh, the Byzantine Empire during the reigns of Justinian and Theodora. Theodora. I don't actually know how to pronounce that correctly, so I go back and forth. <laughs> um, but he wrote a history of the reign, and then he also wrote a secret history. The one book was the official history of the reign that was published, then rightly praised them. Uh, the secret history is, all, is where all the good stuff is, about how Theodora was a circus performer and a whore uh, before marrying Justinian, scandal, um, and uh, Justinian was nowhere near as great a commander as people think he was, and so on. So even in that case, when we're talking about primary source material, one author has two different viewpoints. So anytime you're researching something and using a primary source, um, especially a narrative, you want to get as many different viewpoints as you can. If you are looking at a primary source that isn't, that's a document, but isn't a narrative, for example, if you're looking at account books um, for, you know, what was bought, what was paid for, uh, at a lot of um, ac upper academic levels of history, this is one of the things you will look at constantly. You want to look for what do they include, what do they not include, what do they consider important, what did they not consider important. If you want to know how Henry the Seventh treated his wife, which is a some subject of debate, look at how much money he spent on her and for what. Uh, he bought her a lion. You know, and people like to say Henry the Seventh was a miser. He brought he bought her a lion, so clearly wasn't as mis miserly as people think. Certainly not to his wife. Okay. So, wrap it up and tell us what you're going to talk to us in the next part. Uh, so, in the next part, I'm going to continue talking more about issues with primary sources. Then we're going to move on to secondary sources and how to find sources. Alright. Say goodbye. Bye.